My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Samir Handuja to discuss cyberbullying and social media, the role of parents, youth, and the community. Welcome, Samir. Thank you very much, Charlene. And I'd like to extend my appreciation to Bev and Carla and Kim. Thank you for translation services. We don't have a lot of time together tonight. I just want to thank you for, for showing up. And I want you to know that there's so many issues at the intersection of youth and technology. And I don't want you to leave feeling um, more afraid or more nervous about um, various sorts of incidents that might happen to the kids that you shepherd and take care of. I want you to leave encouraged and empowered with specific actionable strategies. And so that'll be my goal today. I probably won't be able to cover absolutely everything that you want me to. And so I've had to pick and choose in terms of content but I wanna extend the offer that if you need anything in the future, maybe a specific resource, maybe a deep dive into this subtopic or that subtopic, I'm happy to help you out with that. Don't hesitate to reach out. I take great pride in getting back to individuals who reach out simply because as a parent, as an educator, um, as a community member, you know, there's, there's so much to do in this area and we just wanna to try to be proactive um, so that we can, can take care of those who are under our care. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides and we'll get started. Before I talk about some of the negatives, I think it's important for us to spend a few minutes discussing the positives because um, it's easy to, again, focus on those negatives and get overwhelmed and get slightly or severely freaked out when it comes to you know, incidents and offenses and various forms of harm. To begin, I watch a lot of TED Talks. Maybe you can relate to that. When it comes to TED Talks, I have learned so much in the areas of leadership. Um, I've been inspired by, by athletes who have shared their story. Um, in this case, we've got a seven-year-old girl, Molly Wright, who gave a TED Talk specific to the issue of how parents can work with children in homes to create thriving environments. So inspiring, so amazing. And this wouldn't have been possible had it not been for, for TED and had it not been for technology allowing us to you know, receive and digest and internalize this, this information to make our lives better. Additionally, we're seeing a lot of youth using social media in order to share of their struggles. This wasn't a trend until you know, a handful of years ago. When I was growing up personally, it felt like we were supposed to just pose and posture and pretend that we had it all together, even though every adolescent, every adolescent was struggling in some capacity. But now it feels that more individuals are disarmed to share their story, to, to discuss what they're facing, and ideally to inspire others about how they've overcome. You know, this specific student is just discussing that, you know, they struggle with depression. I've seen stories related to eating disorders, anxiety, a number of topics. Again, to destigmatize it, to convey to everyone that this is just part and parcel of the human condition, and again, to remind everyone that we can get through this. We have other students who are taking the time to explain some of these major adolescent issues, such as in this case, trauma, but do so in a way that doesn't come across as lecturing or preachy or too scientific and um, not really, again, relevant to, to youth these days, but in a way that other youth will connect with that message and understand the various sorts of you know, nuance, nuances and colors and contours of the phenomenon. I think that's great. I think we need to continue to empower youth um, encouraging them to create content that is positive, that is helpful, and that is inspiring. We also see various um, platforms that have been able to provide services because of technology, because of social media, because of um, you know various sorts of ways that you're able to connect with others and they're able to connect with you. We think about Crisis Text Line and how many youth are so much more comfortable texting and discussing their issues through that medium instead of, of course, picking up the phone and calling an adult or stopping by the counselor's office um, between classes or after school. And then through Crisis Text Line and other services like that, they're connected with professional and tra trained counselors who can also liaison with individuals in the community to provide localized support. Again, this would not be possible had it not been for technology and the developments that continue to come down the pike. This simply involves live streaming. And when I think about live streaming, just, you know, of course, it's happening in real time. And it's important for technology to be at a point where we're able to identify some sort of threat that might be taking place, whether it's an impending school shooting or 
whether it's related to an individual about to harm themselves. And so thankfully we do have that technology when it comes to live streaming and it'll continue to get better and better and better. And I love to see that. And of course, we hope that more and more platforms will devote more and more resources, you know, um, monies and personnel um, and time to all of these issues um, when you're thinking about trust and safety and privacy and security, because we just see, we just think about this user base and all the various vulnerabilities that they face. And um, we're looking forward to, again, new developments, continuing to support all of us who go online and try to benefit from um, all the technology has to offer in terms of meeting our communication needs, our social needs, our entertainment needs, our academic and professional needs. Um, we want to continue to, again, embrace and exploit all of that, but without fear, without concern. So again, hopefully the technology will continue to advance in that direction. So let's talk about some of the negatives. And I'd like to just spend a few minutes discussing the research because it's easy to hear the sensationalistic stories in the news headlines and um, just get really upset. It's also easy to focus on this anecdotal account or this specific situation amongst your friend group or a coworker and think that that's the norm. When it comes to cyberbullying, we've been studying it for a number of years. Um, it's typically where you have individuals being cruel to each other online, you know, whether it's using a cell phone or a gaming console or again, some sort of online platform. What we found as we studied this is that it's between one out of three and one out of four youth between the ages of 12 and 17 who have dealt with this form of harm. Again, 33% um, as a high and maybe 25% as, as a low, thinking about the prevalence of cyberbullying across youth, again, between the ages of 12 and 17. What we can tell is that it's not spiraling out of control. It's not this mass epidemic that is getting worse and worse and worse by the day. But with that said, that's a meaningful proportion of youth. And I think you'll agree with me when I say that, yeah, we've absolutely got to do something specific and uh, meaningful about it when it comes to identific identification, prevention, and response. I think about the various platforms on which cyberbullying can happen. And if you were to ask me, is there one that you know, youth or adults should stay away from, you know, I wouldn't be able to point to this one or that one simply because the interactive capabilities of every platform, again, whether it's social media or short form video or um, gaming, if there's that interactive capabilities, you might have individuals who want to troll or be hateful or be malicious with regard to sentiments they want to issue in your direction. The kicker is the vast majority of youth are using these platforms responsibly, respectfully. And of course, we want to encourage that. And you know, when I train educators, we talk about how we want to marshal peer pressure um, in a positive way, you know, to induce those who are on the fringes, those who are on the margins, to do the right thing on these platforms. Because when we go online, we want to have a great time. We want to enjoy all that it has to offer. I also want to bring to your attention the phenomenon of digital dating abuse. I know that sounds very dramatic, digital dating abuse. Um, another way to characterize it is online dating violence. And when I think about online dating violence, I think about how you know maybe your partner, someone you're flirting with, someone that you're in a relationship with, um, is asking for your password so they can log into your accounts to make sure that you're not talking to another guy or another girl. Or they might be tracking you via GPS, you know, to make sure that you are where you say you are, um, invading your privacy in a number of ways. We just see power and control and abuse um, occurring in romantic relationships amongst youth. And that could be for a variety of reasons. It may be primarily because youth don't have the best models around them about what is healthy when it comes to romantic relationships. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I personally like to emphasize is that how are we, how are we displaying this? How are we providing models to emulate? How are we training youth in terms of what is dysfunctional and what is healthy when it comes to these romantic relationships? In our research, we found that about 14% have been victimized offline in terms of dating violence. Again, these are 12 to 17 year olds. One out of 10 were victimized online, but this is important. Four out of five of those who were victimized online were also victimized offline. So maybe I'm going through your phone today, going through your inbox or your um, direct messages to, making, to make sure you're not talking to a, another boy, but maybe tomorrow I push you into a wall. Again, I know that sounds very dramatic, but I'm trying to make a point here that there's a strong overlap. We also found that 63% of those who were victimized offline in terms of dating violence were also victims online. So just have this on your radar. 
maybe you, your youth is starting to talk about, um, you know, just dating and relationships. And so we want to have those conversations. Then sexting, I just wanted to share with you um, some of our research, again, national level data. What we found is that one out of four have received a nude. About 14% have sent a nude. About one out of four have been asked by somebody else to send them a nude image or video. And about one out of 10, 11% have asked somebody else for a nude. Again, here, we don't see these numbers um, on the drastic increase. They've held pretty steady as we've studied it over the course of a number of years. But of course, you and I would also like these numbers to be much closer to zero. One of the concerns that we have with sextortion, and you know, I cover it in a variety of ways to make sure that my message does resonate with students when I have the opportunity to speak at schools, but um, it is important to bring up sextortion in that you know, this is a reality and it's occurring to about 5% of youth. I know 5% seems, comparatively speaking, like a pretty tiny number, but one out of 20, when you extrapolate that out to the tens of millions of, of youth in our country, that's significant. You know, we're an individual who has somehow gotten access to your nudes, messages you and blackmails you and says that if you don't send me money or additional sexual pictures or, or content or engage in sexual activity with me, we've seen that as well, that I'm gonna release these pictures to your parents, to law enforcement, to the school, and you don't want that to happen. At the Cyberbullying Research Center, I co-run that with my colleague, Dr. Justin Patchen. We receive help requests related to sextortion every single week. And then my last point of data has to do with what's called digital self-harm. Digital self-harm. What we found a handful of years ago is that some youth, it seems like they're being cyberbullied, seems like they're being targeted viciously by somebody else online. But when you do the investigation and you look at IP addresses of the posts, of the comments, it's actually coming from their own devices from their own home network, so to speak. And so what we found is that there's a lot of self cyberbullying going on. Individuals anonymously are creating accounts and targeting themselves. Why would a youth do that? Well, in our research, what we found is that it's about 5% of youth. So again, one out of 20 youth um, who have engaged in, in digital self-harm or self cyberbullying. And they do it as a cry for help, as a call for attention, in order to see who their true friends are, because if they're ostensibly being targeted online by other people, then they want to see who will rise up to defend them. Now, clearly, this is dysfunctional. In our research, what we found is that those who engage in digital self-harm, well, there's a strong correlation with traditional forms of self-harm, cutting, burning, hitting oneself, etc. Plus, there's a strong tie to suicidal ideation, thoughts, as well as attempts. Again, I don't, I don't want to scare you. That's not my point, my goal here at all. Um, I just want this to be on your radar. Again, we talked about cyberbullying, digital dating violence, sexting, and digital self-harm. There's a number of topics as well, but those are the ones I wanted to focus on um, today, just again to set this backdrop before we immediately turn the corner and get into prevention and response. So as I mentioned, if you need any more specifics, if you'd like to explore um, a certain sub area in much more detail after this presentation, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll do all that I can to help you. But to begin, let's talk about communication. Communication matters. I see so many parents who are hyper involved in their kids' offline lives, whether that's dance recitals or lacrosse or soccer or debate, but many times they're hands off when it comes to their kids' online lives. Maybe, arguably, it's because they're assuming that the school is covering this in some sort of digital citizenship modules or um, you know, cyber ethics type of, of curriculum. And I think that many schools are definitely doing their part, but we need a united front. This has to be brought up at home as well. I'd love for you to go online with your kids. I know that's tricky. I know that maybe when you even suggested, they might roll their eyes and, and look the other way, but maybe there's an opportunity somehow. Maybe you can just go to Starbucks with them and order your favorite beverages and sit down at a table with them, with the phone, maybe with a tablet, and just ask them very sort of, um, pro-social questions about you know, what they're doing, um, what they're loving, what is becoming more lame, what they think the next disruptive app will be. You know, Just have a very non-judgmental, non-critical conversation with them just to get the proverbial ball rolling. And then over time, not immediately after this presentation tonight, but over time, you can get into the more difficult questions. Start early. Um, I have little ones and they're so proficient, it's shocking when it comes to you know, grabbing my phone or borrowing the tablet. And I know that many of you understand that. 
Plus, we have to watch our own words because you and I are capable of being a jerk when we've had a very long day, we're short, we're curt, we're a little bit rude, but we have to call ourselves out when we make a mistake. I think it's okay to be human and to mess up as long as we use that as a teachable moment till we say, oh, son, daughter, I'm, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have acted that way. You know, um, you know, we're better than that. And we try to treat everyone with patience and with grace. And when you see it in reality TV or in a movie and you're watching that movie together, I hope that you will pause it and you'll say, whoa, 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 whoa. That person crossed the line. I mean, that was that was offensive. And I know that they were trying to be sarcastic or funny or impress their buddies, but that was way too far. You know, there's a line and we don't sort of try to get as close to the line as possible. We stay pretty far back to the line because again, that's how we would want other people to treat us. Plus I think family standards are so important. And I trust that you've had that conversation with your kids. In my household, my partner and I, her name is Rachel. We have we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what are the foundational values that we're going to build our home on. And so then we decided to get it sort of immortalized in the sign, which hangs above our couch in our family room, which is the room in which we spend most of the time. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, as life occurs and as experience happened to my kids, I haven't been able to point to all of these, but I've definitely been able to point to honesty or this incident with the friends and how courage is relevant or how humility is relevant. And over time, as they continue to grow up, I'm gonna be able to talk about some of these other, again, core values, our non-negotiables. And I think they matter. And I think that as you continue to reinforce them, it'll become part and parcel of who they are. It'll be part and parcel of what the Hinduja family is all about. So when you're thinking about, again, communicating with your kids and having conversations, you know, I want you to, again, start with those non-judgmental, those vanilla questions. Here are some of them. And we'll make sure that we get to you, those of you who are on this call, you know, the resources that you need. Um, one of the resources I want to get to you is called Questions Parents Should Ask. Um, and it'll allow you, again, to, you know, stimulate that conversation, to initiate that dialogue in these positive ways, and then over time to get into the more probing and sensitive questions. So be on the lookout for that resource. I wanna spend a couple of minutes thinking about resilience. When I think about resilience, which by the way, just simply means the ability to overcome adversity, I often picture a rubber ducky in a bathtub of water. And what happens when you push that rubber ducky under the surface of the water? Well, it pops back up to the surface. And so I think that's just a, a powerful image because, <coughs> excuse me, we want our youth to be resilient. We want them as they deal with various forms of harm to be able to, to overcome to allow it to just kind of roll off their shoulders. Now, to be sure, I would never argue or advocate for resilience in major instances, in severe instances of bullying, cyberbullying, interpersonal harm. But the truth is, is that the vast majority of, of peer conflict um, is it's minor, it's mild, you know, it's name calling, insults, um, exclusion, rejection. And in those situations, I mean, the reality is, is that you and I face that in the workforce, you know, when it comes to some of our our salty colleagues, or maybe even with in-laws. And so in the safe and supportive environment of our home, do we not want them to develop a certain set of tools to deal with relational conflict? Again, because it's gonna happen. And so just constantly thinking about, again, how can we build resilience, especially on a social and relational level? We studied this and big picture, we found that resilience matters. We found that individuals with high levels of resilience, when they were targeted, it didn't deeply affect them. It didn't deeply hurt and bother them. Whereas those with low levels of resilience, it did deeply bother them and affect them, their ability to learn and feel safe at school. This specific chart also shares a different but related story. What we found is that youth with the highest levels of resilience, when they were cyberbullied, and again, let's just say for a moment that every kid might, when those kids were cyberbullied, those with the highest levels of resilience, they engaged in what are called pro-social responses. You can see that on the far right of your screen. They reported it to the school. They reported it to the site. They changed their screen name or their username. Maybe with the parents' help or guardian's help, they called the police. Maybe they deleted their account, blocked the other user. They believed in their agency to control their online experience. That's what we wanna see. We don't want them just to take the abuse. Unfortunately, those with the lowest levels of resilience, you can see on the far left of the chart, they did nothing. They suffered silently. That's why resilience is so key, so essential. There's a model that I really like out of the University of Pennsylvania, the ABC model. 
adversity, beliefs, and consequences. Adversity, beliefs, and consequences. When you and I face adversity, and maybe it's bullying, maybe it's related to some other major stressor in our life, immediately we adopt certain beliefs to explain that adversity away, to come to terms with it, to reframe it so that we can just keep going, so that we don't get stuck or, or paralyzed in the moment simply because the adversity is so heavy. This is something that's done very reflexively, very automatically. We adopt certain beliefs so we can cope. Many times though, those beliefs are very unhealthy and they lead to problematic outcomes. They lead to consequences in terms of acting out, lashing out, um, interpersonal harm, self-harm. Again, just these dysfunctional reactions and they undermine any sort of resilient responses. And so what we want is to, over time, it's gonna take a while, help our youth move in the direction where those beliefs that result after the adversity are more, again, healthy and positive and resilient. So to give you an example, this might be my adversity. Let's say that I'm a girl and I see on Instagram that I was not invited to a sleepover. Okay, so that's my adversity. What are the beliefs I immediately adopt to explain this away, just to come to terms with it? It might go like this. Oh my goodness, they had a sleepover without me. I can't believe this. This is crushing. Why would they do that? I thought I was part of their squad. I thought I was part of their crew. Clearly I'm not. And maybe that's how it's always been. Maybe just when I'm around, they kind of pretend that I belong with them, that we're friends, but maybe they talk bad about me when I leave the room or I'm not around. Maybe right now at the sleepover, they're talking smack about me. Maybe they're saying the most awful, awful things about me. And actually this confirms what happened last weekend with a couple of other friends. And then the previous week at school. Yeah, I mean, it feels like my entire life is this history of examples where I'm always on the outside. I'm always going to be rejected. I don't fit in anywhere. I'm a loser. You saw how quickly that just devolved into chaos. But maybe it could go in a different direction. Maybe something like this. Oh, man, they had a sleepover without me. That, that does hurt my heart a lot. But maybe there's a good reason for this. Maybe they got together after soccer practice. And maybe the mom said you could have a couple girls over. And, and we were on vacation. And if I was there... I'm sure they would have wanted to invite me as well, like without a doubt. And, and plus, they're not responsible for how much fun I'm going to have in my life. I could talk to my mom right now, and we could organize the most epic sleepover forever this weekend. So there again, that's a resilient response. That's what we want to try to do. I could spend a whole hour discussing so many various sorts of you know, resilient strategies and exercises and activities. Um, let me just share a couple more. I think a lot about reading. And I think about how I was a big reader. Maybe your child is as well. Well, there's a lot of books where resilience is just a dominant theme when it comes to the protagonist. And so I would hope that we're able to maybe have our children read certain books and then have a conversation about what are the takeaways? How can you apply this to your life? Two of my favorite books across, across my entire life are Of Human Bondage, which is in the middle row on the left, and The Count of Monte Cristo, which is in the middle row on the right. And by the way, I can get you these um, slides, the PDF of them, so you don't need to furiously take down notes. And as Charlene, Charlene mentioned, we can also get you a recording. Also, by the way, if you want to message me and tell me a little bit more about uh, your child, their gender, age, and interest, maybe I can suggest specific um, books or, or movies, which I'll talk about in a second. But the point is, we want to use media, traditional media, as well as um, you know online media or um, video-related media to teach our kids, you know, various sort of important life lessons. And again, I've learned so many from books. Here are my favorite movies related to resilience. You've seen many of them. I would say basically every movie has a strong theme of resilience. But when you finish a movie in your living room and it's, you know, the evening time, do you just say, okay, kids, make sure you go upstairs and brush your teeth and don't forget to floss because you ate a lot of popcorn. Or do you have a conversation? How were you inspired by that movie? Again, how can you apply um, that aspect or, you know, this person's life um, to your own life? And maybe it doesn't have to do, be that night, but maybe the next morning when you're, you know, dropping the kid off at school, something like that. There's got to be an opportunity to apply what we're learning from media to our lives and be changed for the better because of it. That's my dad and my little, my sister. He came over from India without really knowing a soul because he wanted a better life for his future children, which is me and my sister. I love that. I'm sure it was very difficult, but it's a story of resilience. And I would say that each of you, everyone on this call, you have stories of resilience in your own life. And I'd look, like for you to look for opportunities to share those stories with your children. 
And hopefully down the road, some opportunity or um, you know, incident arises and they think to themselves, you know what? There's resilience in my family and I'm gonna rise up like my stepdad did or like my aunt did or like my mom did because that's who we are, we're resilient. Try to find a way where you can share those stories. That is my shoulder. Um, I'm allergic to a lot of things. Thankfully, they're all environmental and not food-based, but I'm allergic to cockroaches, dust mites, pollen. I'm allergic to cats and dogs, which is very, very sad um, for my kids. But I think one day I'm just gonna be like, forget it, we're getting a dog or we're getting a cat just because I just, I want them to be happy. <laughs> but um, anyways, the point here is that I get allergy shots and my allergy doctor, what happens is that um, she takes small portions of each of these disease causing pathogens, you know, these allergens, and she mixes them up. She just sort of swirls them up into this concoction or serum. And then she injects me with small doses of it just to see how I'm going to react. Now, of course, she says, you need to wait here for 20 minutes to make sure that your throat doesn't close up and you have some sort of major reaction. And I'm going to be over here in my office, but she's, she's there just in case something goes completely sideways. And I think this is also a really good metaphor when it comes to resilience, because um, in a safe and supportive environment of our home, we want to introduce risk because the pathway to resilience is not the avoidance of risk, but engagement with it. And so hopefully we're able to do that by, again, introducing them and just seeing how they fare. Yes, we're over here to kind of swoop in if we need to, but we're not by default always swooping in and rescuing them because that's going to ill prepare them for life. We want to give them a chance to figure out, okay, you messed up on this app or this platform, and now there's a screenshot or a screen recording, and I'm going to see how you're going to deal with this. And yes, I might fill in the gaps, and yes, I might um, amend your solution or strategy. Um, I'm just going to see how you're going to deal with this. And I want you to get the practice to restore equilibrium, to make things right in this relationship, in this friendship. Let's talk about empathy for a few minutes. Empathy is just such a key construct, right? We want to continue to be intentional about building it in the lives of our youth. I could spend another hour discussing all sorts of resilient strategy, or sorry, all sorts of empathy related strategies. Um, and so please follow up with me if you wanna take a deep dive related to empathy, but let's just talk about a few of them. Before I do, the research. We studied this and what we found was that students with low levels of empathy were about two times as likely to bully someone at school in the last month and over two times as likely to cyber bully someone in the last month. But those with high levels of empathy, man, empathy matters. Those with high levels of empathy were over two times less likely to bully and almost three times, 2.7 times, less likely to cyber bully. So again, it's key. But is this just gonna naturally occur? No, we have to, again, be very intentional, very strategic about building empathy in the lives of our children. Here are my favorite shows. Maybe you've seen some of them, where again, the protagonist, main character, they're all about empathy. But it's all about those follow-up conversations you have afterwards, after, after they watch an episode, after they watch a season. Again, how can we apply this to our life? How are you inspired by that character? Here are my favorite books. And again, different books for different age groups. Feel free to follow up with me if you want specific recommendations. But empathy matters, and uh, my heart has been softened by the books I've read. My heart has been softened by some of the movies that I've watched over the years. I remember the storyline. I remember specific scenes. And we also want to make sure that our kids are not growing up in a bubble where they're just interacting with individuals just like them. And so maybe you could assign them some sort of task where they try to connect with others who they might not normally sit with at lunch. Maybe, just maybe, they meet a friend, maybe even a best friend that, that normally would never happen because they stepped out of their comfort zone, because they learned about someone from a different background. And that background could be anything, political, racial, ethnic, religious, doesn't matter. But obviously, we have so much more in common than we do different, and this is key. But naturally, maybe your kids will just hang out with the same kids from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Let's be intentional about that, too. I'm a big fan of Tim Tebow, and he organizes what's called Night to Shine, which is a prom for youth with special needs. Every spring, he organizes this, and he goes to one, but there's so many others that occur across the nation. And he enlists the help of youth without special needs to come and serve as waiters, ushers, dance partners, and they build real meaningful long-term relationships with those kids with special needs. And so what I'm trying to get at is, how are we intentionally putting our children 
in environments and situations where they will be stretched, where it might be a little bit awkward and uncomfortable, but they push through. Their hearts are softened. They realize that they're very fortunate and others are less fortunate and they have the power to brighten other people's day, to be a blessing, to make a positive difference. Could be missions trips. Um, I went to a number of emerging and developing countries while I was growing up and my heart was shattered when I saw poverty, when I saw malnutrition, when I saw deformation, you know, youth, kids missing limbs. And that's caused me to be able to now that I have resources, do a world of good in the community, not just here in America, but also across the world. That wouldn't have happened had my, not been, had my heart not been softened when I was young. And so I wanna encourage you to try to figure out how you can make this happen. You don't have to go to another country. In our community, there's such need. Let's bring our kids, maybe even from a young age, even though I know we wanna always be protecting them from sadness, there's much value in doing so. Then let's talk about screen time. I know it is rough. I know it feels like a tug of war. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to negotiate all these recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics in terms of how much screen time to give to our, our kids, but they don't mirror what reality is. The reality is, is that the average, average kid is getting a lot of screen time on a daily basis. And many times that makes us feel a lot of shame, a lot of condemnation, and that's just not a healthy way to operate. So first off, we have to talk about rules. Maybe these mirror what's going on in your own home. If your grades go down, your tech use is gonna go down as well. If you stop contributing to our family in terms of chores, being part of the family unit, yeah, your tech use is gonna go down. You've heard for so many years that we want um, just the phones and the, the tablets to be in a designated location at night, but hopefully you understand that that's simply because we don't want our kids to stay up till one or two on school nights um, of course, they just want to stay in touch with their friends, much like you and I wanted to be on the phone with our best friend, all odd hours of school nights, talking about our latest crush or the latest drama at school. Um, you know, we want them to get some sleep. We want them to be able to focus at school and not be cranky when we ask them how they're doing. And maybe we ask them to maybe pay 10% of the cell phone bill every month, just as a periodic reminder that it is a privilege and not a right. Many kids are like, oh, all my friends have it, so I should have it as well. But you know, it's it's a privilege and you have to be responsible and you have to show me that you're worthy of the trust of these devices and these platforms and hopefully over time, increasing freedoms. This chart points out that there's a lot of risky behaviors occurring, in this case, driving behaviors by parents. 80% speed, 40% text, 21% don't wear a seatbelt. What I wanna say is that our kids are watching us when we're on the road and they're in the back seat but also when we're on our devices. And so we have to walk the walk. I know it's challenging. I know it requires a lot of forethought. And sometimes you and I, we just need a little bit of an escape to check our favorite platform and just kind of blank out for a second or um, again, check up on the, our favorite sports scores or the NCAA tournament or something like that. But again, our kids are constantly watching us and when they're trying to get our attention and we're looking at our phone all the time, well, that gives them license to do the same thing. I often think it's important to negotiate with your child about what it's gonna to take to earn screen time. And I know you're thinking, my child's in 10th grade, can I still do this at this point? I think, yes, they're still under your roof. And that way, both of you have say in, again, what it, what it takes or what um, is required in order to earn screen time. So just work it out with them. That way, it's not like my way or the highway, it's like, we agreed to this. And then I simply want you to ask these very basic questions. Are they doing good physiologically, relationally, academically? Do they have a variety of hobbies? Are they not just you know, consuming mindlessly, but also creating and learning and leveling up when it comes to certain skill sets based on what they watch um, in, on this platform or that platform? And are they having fun? There's so much learning that's taking place. I learn so much from the videos that I watch. I'm sure you do as well, and our kids do as well. So we don't wanna throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater and say that you know, it's all just kind of mindless drivel because that's not true at all. But sometimes our tone, our body language, the things we say, we're kind of suggesting that. Maybe you can identify that your home is a judgment-free zone. Maybe you even need some sort of visible signage because your, your kids are so nervous to talk to you about issues. They are, they're afraid that you're gonna take away their phone or you know, ban this app or that app, which they, they kind of need just to be in the loop and to be part of the, the social and relational culture, which by the way, you and I, we needed that as well when we were growing up. It was part of our identity. It mattered so much, even though now as we're adults, 
we're able to kind of bracket it and we have many other things going on and it isn't so central and intrinsic to our, our self-worth and, and who we are. And so if you can set this up and even if you're on the verge of freaking out or um, you know conveying blame, they'll point to that sign or you'll point to that sign and you'll be like, okay, deep breath. Let's talk this out. Let's figure out a game plan. Let's work through this. I'm, I'm your advocate. I'm your biggest fan. I'm your number one cheerleader. Let's figure this out. And then again, contracts are important. Another resource we'll get to you is, you know, it's got expectations for the parent, for the guardian, and also for the child in terms of appropriate tech use, but also just how the parent and guardian will be involved in terms of not taking drastic measures, being reasonable, um, not unnecessarily invading privacy. And we'll talk about software as, as I close, but I think it's important to stipulate and set in front of everyone, okay, these are our expectations. We both agreed to them. So let's live them out. And then we can have harmony for the most part, as best as is possible when it comes to, you know, tech use in our household. Also, I've written a number of cyberbullying scripts, which show you how easy it is to have a conversation about harm that occurs online. Now, to be sure, you're not going to act this out in some sort of skit-like fashion, but I just wanted to show you that you, you, even if you feel uncomfortable or unfamiliar with terms or jargon, you can have these conversations. So check out that resource as well. We'll make sure that we get it to you. And then I've written a number of scenarios. Scenarios are so important according to the research because <clears throat> you ask a kid, do you know what to do if you're ever being targeted? Or do you know what to do if you ever see someone being targeted? And they're like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I know what to do. But in the moment, they freeze, they get stuck and they don't know what to do. That's simply because they've never worked through an action plan. Research shows that scenarios, and this is just one involving one platform and one type of harm, and I've the ones I've written cover many platforms and many devices and many types of harm. Well, when you work through it with them, and then you ask follow-up questions, they're able to, again, build that action plan and know what to do and know what not to do. So we'll make sure that we're able to get this resource to you, which I believe is very actionable. Um, so that again, you can, if you have any downtime, if you have some margin, you can maybe chat with them about this scenario or that scenario. Screenshots, they're huge. Of course, they know how to do so on their phone, but maybe they need to do so on their smartwatch. Maybe they need to do so on their VR headset. Screenshots are so, so important because the school needs it for the investigation and the platform needs it to deal with the harassing content and account, ban the account, set on a warning, something like that. Plus we need screen recordings because much of the content is video-based, whether it's a, a story, whether it's a reel, whether it's a short, um, et cetera. And so you can set that up in iOS if you have an Apple device or an Android. Make sure your child does that and make sure their default is, I gotta take a screenshot, I gotta take a screen recording before I delete this because we need that digital evidence. Please, please remind them to do so. Plus we want them to always take advantage of the tools that are at their fingertips, block, mute, report, be in control of your online experience. Don't just take the abuse. You can control who gets to interact with you. When your child's the target, first off, take a deep breath, make sure that they are safe. And again, I mentioned the importance of evidence. Work with the school, but please don't just get on social media and start venting. That's gonna to lead to so many more phone calls that the school has to deal with, and it's gonna slow down everything. School's gotta go through a process to make sure that they don't open themselves up to legal liability or reputational liability. They care about your child. They wanna come through for you. And of course, there's, there's a response when they're taking way too long, and maybe that's another conversation which I'm happy to work with you about. But the point is, is that just give them a little bit of time. Work with the offender's parents if they're reasonable and they don't blow you off. And then service providers should get back to you within one to two days to get the content down if it violates their rules, their terms of service, their community guidelines, et cetera. And then maybe you can even contact the police if it's serious. When your child is the aggressor, talk about the possible effects because I find many times the child just messed up. It could be your son, it could be your daughter. They're not a sociopath. They just messed up in the moment based on emotion, based on spontaneous, spontaneity. And so just get them to understand that this still cuts very deeply, even though you were physically separate from them and you were just behind your screen. Monitor usage, you know, consider software and there's, you know, a number of software that you know, maybe we'll get a chance to, to get into here. Apply consequences, but when you do, please don't be a pushover. This is hard even for me because I love my kids so much. And so I, I install some sort of discipline, but they say something cute and I just want to give them a hug and, you know, 
give them freedoms again within a device. I can't do that. I cannot be a pushover. If I give them an inch, you know what happens. Escalate consequences if the behavior continues. It takes a village and we all have a role to play and that's tech companies for sure. Um, if you have a platform in a community, when you're thinking about you're a coach, you're a, a troop leader, you're a mentor, you know, you can bring up this sort of topic as well because it's not just part of our kids' lives, our teens' lives, it, it is their life. And so please take advantage of your platform and please bring this up. I promise you that they will run with the topic. They will just sort of take over the conversation because it's just so relevant to their lives. But it requires all of us to do our part. And hopefully you're inspired to do so. And of course, you'll stay in touch with the parent venture, with the sponsoring organizations, and also with me if you need absolutely anything. Here's my contact information. And again, I promise to come back, come back to you and get back to you if you need absolutely anything. With that, I want to thank you for your time and attention. And I wanted to make sure that we leave 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'll turn it back over to Charlene. Again, thank you. Oh, Dr. Samir Handuja, that was an incredible presentation. You can I love those emojis, everybody. Thank you. But you were so practical, so family oriented, so reasonable and not scary. And we all really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to start out by asking about a piece of news that we saw today here in Silicon Valley in San Mateo County. The San Mateo Unified High School District is suing some of our favorite big tech companies like TikTok, Snap, and Instagram for unlawfully creating provocative and toxic content to addict and entrap young people, leaving schools to address a destructive and growing youth mental health crisis. Do you think that we're gonna see more of this with schools taking action against tech companies? So this obviously brings in various sorts of law and questions. I won't get into the minutia about, you know, should platforms be held liable for the content that third parties, you, me, our children post. But I will say that obviously this is an area of concern. And I think we might see more lawsuits um, issued simply for the intent and purpose of making sure that this is on everyone's radar, that society cares deeply about this issue. We want more of a call to action so that platforms continue to do what they are doing and elevate their response in terms of technological solutions, social science solutions, research. I'm a researcher. And so it's very important to obviously have um, these platforms work with researchers like myself in order to make a meaningful difference, identify what we can do in order to um, identify those, co those correlates, you know, causes of problematic behavior. And I think most importantly, what we can do to promote civil conversation, to make sure that we're all decent human beings online, to make sure that people feel safe and protected. Absolutely. And we really love your perspective that we want to raise resilient kids. They're going to have social situations, whether they're online or offline. And the more that we as parents can do to prepare them for that, again, as you say, offline or online, the better. So again, always in any conversation like this, people want to know, do you recommend tracking software? Do you recommend privacy controls? You know, I'm an advocate for kids having as much trust and autonomy as we can give them, but sometimes parents need to put some limits. How do you feel about that? I absolutely agree. Um, sometimes I feel like someone needs to protect me from myself when it comes to certain decisions <laughs> um, based on, you know, dysfunctions that we all have. Again, part and parcel of the human condition. And so what I would say is that we have to support our youth and some ways of doing that involve using software. Um, I can recommend a couple, but I would also say that I have no professional relationship with these um, companies. I'm not receiving kickbacks from recommending them to you. Um, I've just checked them out and I really like them, but there's a number that are really good. The ones that I would recommend um, include Circle Plus. I think that it provides, you know, very granular level controls about, you know, turning off or on this app or that app, also providing you with, you know, time limits, being able to shut off this device, but not that device, maybe for a younger kid, but not an older kid, pausing the internet when you want to have dinner together, et cetera, et cetera. And again, great reports. I also like Bark. Um, which you know allows you to receive notifications um, as it goes ahead and analyzes various sorts of messages and content that your your child is receiving. Um, you do have to work with the sensitivity level of those sliders to make sure that um, there's not a lot of false positives because we understand when youth are chatting with each other, they use various sorts of slang and phrases 
which, you know, they're not serious. That's just how they talk. And so um, you just have to work with those controls. But those are the software that I would recommend to you. Um, but again, there's a number of others. If you are using something specifically and you want my feedback, feel free to reach out to me one-on-one. -on -one. And if you want other recommendations, I'm happy to provide. Again, just reach out to me one-on-one. -on -one. You're very generous. Thank you, Dr. Hinduja. So here's a question I think a lot of parents have, kind of the, the alternate perspective. Um, parent asks, I have 11-year-old and 13-year-old girls and have not let them use social media so far. Am I making a mistake? They haven't asked. Should I allow them if they do ask? I love that question. I think if they're not asking, then, you know, let's, you know, let's kick this can down the road a little bit further. They're going to start asking in due time without a doubt. And I'll also say that we want them to develop various sorts of proficiencies and skill sets involving social media. You never know how they gravitate to it. And then they start earning their income part-time or full-time down the road. As all of us move deeper and deeper into an information-based society and economy where more of these workforce positions involve expertise using platforms. And so again, you just never know what their skill set is. And so um, if they're not asking for it, then I would hold off, but they will soon. And then just make it a determination about what's their level of maturity. Have they violated my trust in the past? Um, if not, maybe you open up things for you know this device. And if they do pretty well with texting and with video chat, then you open up access to this app. And if they do pretty well with that one app, for six months or a year, whatever you decide, then you give them another app and another app. The reality is our children, just like us, we wanted more freedoms and more privileges from our parents, from our guardians, as long as we weren't violating their trust. So mm -hmm. that's their mindset as well. Yeah, really good point. I think about our friend, Devorah Heitner, who says, you know, don't start with the full smartphone, start with texting. They've got to kind of get the skills and go up the ladder, right? Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So here is um, here's a parent who's having a tough time with their child who's being cyberbullied. Um, they write, having a tough, tough time with gaslighting. My child has been a victim of Snapchat. Um, there's a number of rumors about her at school. She feels like they, she has not been able to prove it to the school. And when they confronted the child, she lied about it. I think this goes back to your point of really using your phone to take the video to prove it. But do you have any advice? I mean, the child is obviously suffering. Absolutely. I think it's important for the school to defend and support this child because without a doubt, it's probably affected them not just emotionally and psychologically, but academically. And if it's a private, if it's a public school, then all of our students, you know, they have a right um, given to them by our government to feel safe, to be able to feel supported, to feel free, to focus on learning in that environment. In those situations, we do need the screenshot. Maybe there's a bit of a hesitance because on that app, the other person will receive a warning when you take a screenshot of their contents, but that shouldn't dissuade that child from taking the screenshot or another person from taking the screenshot. If someone's doing the wrong thing, they deserve to be busted. And if they're not, they're going to continue to victimize other kids. So the right thing to do, the just thing to do, is for them to you know, get in trouble through the use of you securing digital evidence. And so maybe in that specific situation, that's what's going on. We got to figure out a way to prove this. And again, I would like the school to, I don't know all the details, of course, but I would like the school to, to be responsive because our youth are struggling without a doubt. It's affecting them deeply. Well, I think that teaching even very young children about digital evidence is such a great concept, right? And teenagers would really get that. They want the tools, right? Yeah, and they want to show us that they're savvy. And yeah. so I always remind them, you know, it isn't just about taking screenshots and screen recordings, which is the topic of our conversation. But, you know, I've seen videos where students have taken the time to use Google reverse image search or Google Lens, or they'll use public databases. You all probably know that, you know, if you look up, um, your county records and your property, you know, there's you know, specific information with your name and maybe your address. And so if individuals are doing the wrong thing, um, being racist, saying awful, um, in issuing hate speech, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we've seen videos of students who have taken the time to do the investigations, to track these individuals, to out them. And I know, of course, that there's a slippery slope there. We don't want individuals to out others um, just for the fun of it. But the point there is that they're using their proficiency and their skill set to be a resource to help others to identify who this 
awful aggressor is. And maybe that's very useful for the school and for the platform. Really good point. Parents do listen to that. Um, a parent is asking to repeat, if you don't mind repeating the software you recommended for tracking, I think it's Circle Plus and Bark. Was there it any? Is, yeah, and I know it's in the chat window. And so um, maybe you just scroll up a little bit, but great question. Okay. Here's a question that we've actually been getting for, for years and years since the social media really got big. And this, this is, how do you feel about requiring that your children give you a password to their social media accounts? I know how I feel. I want to know how you feel. I think if they're young, absolutely. If they're maybe 16 or 17 and they have lived a life of um, impeccable um, integrity, then, you know, maybe you're like, okay, you know, you've, you've shown me that you can handle this. And so it's fine. I don't, I don't need your password. When they're young, absolutely. Just as a quick follow-up, it's all for the deterrent purpose because you know you and I as parents we don't have time every day to go into their phone and rifle through their messages but as long as they know in the back of their mind that at any given point that could happen because they do have my password then hopefully it keeps them on the straight and narrow now it might of course we can't control everything but the purpose there again is deterrence yeah it's like when your kids first start in these apps if they'll let you friend them or join them, great. The trick is parents never show your face again. Like, you know, you, your kids can know, like you say that you're watching, but don't intrude on their life online. They don't like it any more than we would like it. Right. It's a good point. I love it. Oh my goodness. Um, what about <laughs> parent asks, is there any legal protection around cyberbullying? So there are a number of bullying laws across the nation. Without a doubt, every state has a bullying law. Uh, they vary when it comes to their detail and scope. And so what we tend to see is that in cyberbullying cases, we have to use traditional um, laws and sort of shoehorn, the, shoehorn them in. Um, for example, it could be harassment. It could be invasion of privacy. Sometimes I've seen situations where we have defamation of character, um, infliction, intentional infliction of emotional distress, both of those would be you know, perhaps civil actions that could um, take place. And so I've worked with a number of attorneys um, in expert witness capabilities over the years. And so I'm happy to recommend some of those if there's a need for legal action to be initiated in some of these cases when you're not making headway in any other way. All right. What do you think is a good way to open a conversation with a teenager around cyberbullying. I mean, again, teens kind of think they know everything. How would you start the conversation? I mean, you've given us some great tips tonight and parents just asking questions like Dr. Hinduja recommended is the best way to go. Well, I would make sure that I do have that open line of communication that would take months and years to build. And hopefully if that's in place and they know that, you know, I'm in their corner and I'm just trying to keep them from, sabotaging their future and, you know, dealing with regret and really messing up all of the amazing things that they're working for. You know, if we have that type of relationship, um, then I'm, I'm going to ask them that, you know, I've been hearing some stories about, you know, some kids, you know, they're, they're really being targeted and it's affecting them deeply. Have you ever seen that happen to another kid? So that's mm -hmm. how I would start it off, you know, sort of the third person aspect of it, where it's okay, you know, as you survey the landscape of your peer group, has any of your friends dealt with something really heavy? Um, you know, something, you know, really awful. And maybe they'll open up to you. Maybe they will anonymize it and not give you any specifics. Or maybe they'll say, yeah, you know, my best friend, you know, and you're good friends with their parents. They had to deal with this. And so hopefully through the conversation of the other person and the way that you react, if again, it's non-judgmental, very understanding, very empathetic, not talking about how, yeah, I, I know that that kid is always online, always on their device. And so it makes sense that eventually they're going to be targeted. None of those snide remarks. Just be understanding. Just realize that this is their life. Um, hopefully over time, a little bit later, you can say, all right, well, you know, can we talk about your life just briefly? Again, I'm not trying to you know, be all about your business, but just curious. Have you dealt with something that's similarly heavy that, I don't know, like it wrecked your emotions or ruined your mood for a few hours a day? maybe a whole week, and maybe there was fallout at school. And so again, if you're able to, again, have those conversations in a non-judgmental fashion, in an easygoing fashion, um, where you're talking slowly, not loudly, um, you're communicating that, look, you know, I care about you, and I'm your, I'm your, I'm your dad, let's say. Um, I just, I want to be able to help you, and I want you to know that you can come to me 
if there's anything that you deal with that makes you feel uncomfortable or creeped out or weird or insulted or harmed, just come to me. We'll chat it out and we'll work together. We'll figure out a solution. Such great advice, Samir. And the key there again, parents, is non judgmental. All right, last question. You are in a field that we are all so curious about, but in today's fast paced digital world, Dr. Hinduja, what gives you hope? I love seeing more and more youth create positive content. Uh, I see so many youth discussing social justice issues that they care about. I see so many um, youth figuring out certain skill sets that they're learning primarily online and then taking that to support their families, you know, to help other individuals who might be voiceless, who might not have any platform at all. And I think that's going to continue. I feel like many youth do feel empowered. I just want to make sure that as adults, we continue to encourage them, resource them, and support them. That was wonderful. Well, listen, Dr. Samir Hinduja, this has been an amazing, amazing presentation. We've had people saying this is the best one we've ever had. You've been so generous with all of us, and we really are grateful. We thank you. We thank San Mateo County Office of Education, and we thank you, everybody who was on with us tonight. Really, really wonderful. Dr. Hinduja is generously offering his slides. We will have the video recording of this available shortly. So again, please join me in a really warm virtual thank you. This was wonderful. Take care, everybody. Good night. Hope to see you again soon.